speaker this evening was formerly, prior to his current role, the CTO of Versata, which was one of the top five IPOs of the Y2K. Anybody here remember the Y2K show of hands? All right, just check. Look a little young in the audience. Wow. <laughs> Please welcome the co-founder and CTO of Espresso Logic, Val Hubbard. We didn't tell you all the rules. When we do more um, sort of questions, if you get the wrong answer, you have to throw a t-shirt back. <laughs> Be careful. Okay. How many people have had a look at our website? Do you have any idea what you're, gonna, what you're in for today? Not a kid, probably. How many people here um, are pretty familiar? How many people are pretty familiar with West and Jason? Is that what it looks like? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you're like the folks in San Francisco, the folks that didn't raise their hand would like a little bit of background on that, now we'll provide that. It's pretty simple. Uh, how many people here are basically programmers of one group sort of so That's good. Good. Database applications, I'm guessing that. Good. Well, you're in the right place. So, um, let's start. I did very well. So, how many people are part of reactive program? It's not a pretty good role. Yeah, that's kind of, that's, you're kind of like the San Francisco bunch. You know, maybe 10% of the people have heard it. Uh, it turns out to be a technology Everybody here is used. We'll, we'll reveal that in here. We're going to talk about not reactive in general, but reactive in the context of database stuff. Because we're in the database stuff. And we're going to talk about that rest thing I was talking about. I'm going to give you a demo. I hope you'd like to see that. And what we'll do is we'll create an application, like a real application from scratch, using everybody's favorite database to uh, And we'll talk about how to add reactive logic. I have some I have some complex examples which we probably won't get to, that's why they're in parentheses. But at least you should know that while this demo was simple, it actually can do very complicated problems. So, and then there's questions. And that, that's for you guys. Okay. So I'm not gonna spend much time on our company. This is not a technology that's brand new. Uh, it was part of the Versata company. Uh, and we had lots of lots of uh, applications. Um, things like 500 tables, 1,000 tables, pretty big applications, tens of thousands of users, so it's, it's been around the block. Uh, current version has been in, in development for several years, but we just launched it as a product in the last year or so. We are going to see 100 as we saw. And we're basically, think of this as a full stack um, sort of application system. And you'll see what I mean by that. But basically, you'll get the screens, the logic, the query, and the REST API to connect to uh, the other apps. Uh, and we sell via direct reseller, so if any of you folks would like to get involved in that way, we'd love to do that. So what's the active program? So this looks a little like a script. Well, this is, sorry, it's not true. T0 and T1, that's time. So I'm writing a program here. If I write a program and I, I say you know, A equals B plus C, and then later on, blah, 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 I say B equals 2. The question I was would ask uh, is, what happens to A? And if you're writing C Sharp or Java or Ruby, or in, in almost any language that exists, the answer is nothing. A, a got set, the, the CPU went on its merry way, and that's that. The difference with reactive programming is that A equals B plus C is essentially a definition. It's like, for now and for all time, A will equal B plus C. So if B changes or C changes, I want you to update A for okay? It's kind of a, it's, it's turning upside down the entire notion of program flow going point, 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 point. It's saying when things change, stuff happens. It reacts. It's what we're reacting. So the key pieces of it, just for review, is you, you, you have to have some way of saying a definition that this thing is defined like that, this cell, this variable is defined like that. Once you do that, you're done. The system, and I'm being very vague about the system, then watches for changes to B or C, which means the system has to know your variables and stuff like that. 
And if it notices changes to the erected state, it has to be prepared. And so the, the three steps are define, watch, and react. You define the system watches and reacts. Okay. Microsoft, somebody, uh, I think raised their hand, uh, said that they had used uh, React a little bit or looked into it. Most likely, it's in the context of uh, GUI stuff. In other words, if the model changes, you need to reflect that in your view. If the data changes, I'm showing it here, here, here. Let me know. So, uh, lots of work there. Some, some level of excitement. But the, when I said everybody here has used it, what I meant was the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is the example of reactive program. It's the, the killer application of reactive program. And it's amusing that the people who are promoting reactive programming sort of suggest that it's a brand new technology, when in fact it's been around since the Middle 80s. So it's, it's good marketing. Reactive programming in general is a very hard problem. Because inserting it into a programming language is no mean feat. Because the programming language has to know all the variables that might refer to this thing. And it's, it's a hard problem. But there's this notion of domain-specific languages, right? Where you, if you compress the domain to certain kinds of problems, you can deliver much greater power with much more simplicity. So if we take the notion of reactive, just a, a spreadsheet concept, I don't mean the technology. There's not an Excel spreadsheet hiding under the covers here. But if you take the notion of reactive programming and apply it to database, you can do some remarkable things. So, if you're going to say A equals B plus C, there has to be some definition. The system has got to know where did A, B, and C come from. I mean, you can't, you can't have a language without knowing where the variables come from, right? In what our product does, the schema is the object model. So you wouldn't say A equals B plus C, you'd say customer got this equals order got that. In other words, you, the, the tables and columns are your model, or your programming model. Now, now we'll think in terms of translating it into JavaScript, we'll do that later. Just, you know, just as a conceptual thing, the database objects are your model, just your schema. Right? And what we do is we simply give you a, a mechanism to say, for this database column, here's an expression that defines how it's computed. So you bind an expression to a column. Think of, think of your DDL as, in addition to defining a name and type and length and what it allows not, as having an expression on the end that says, here's how this is computed. I'll give some examples just a minute. That's one kind, so derivations. And the second uh, thing that you can do is to find is that the tables validations, like the balance must uh, not be exceeded by the credit limit, or you know people can't hold over 25 children or something. The things you do to catch up, right? Uh, perfectly, you know, our, our standard example of uh, the derivation expression is the balance is the sum of the unpaid overtimes. Now, I haven't described the model or anything. But I wager, you know, knowledge to know it, that everybody understands what I just meant. Right? You already understand that there's probably a customer, there's orders, there's a some field in order called amount, there's some up for the orders that are paid in this term. Turns out that this language, quote unquote, is an excellent language for business users because they get it in the same way they get a spreadsheet. That balance equals the sum of the unpaid order totals. To me, and I hope to you. Sounds a little like a spreadsheet formula, except for a database client. That, that strike anybody as, you know, untrue? Or does it seem like, yeah, it seems like um, Later on, we'll talk about some imperative integration, but that's extremely important. You can, you're looking at a brand new technology that's brand new to you, and you're going to be wondering, how much can it do, so forth. That's, that's what I would be wondering, at least in your position. The answer is not everything. So if it doesn't do everything that you need to do or anything, then the system has to marry this reactive stuff with another language. It's called an imperative language. So you can so you can do whatever isn't addressed in this reactive. Reactive is often characterized as declarative. So if, if the word declarative is buzzing around your mind, 
you're in very good shape and you're, you're getting it. So this is just a concept. Let's go ahead. How might you implement this reactive engine? You can do it lots of ways. I mean, there's, there's no particularly one right way by any means. You can take these reactive definitions and you can generate triggers in your favorite trigger language. It's a SQL or a person. Um, you can generate triggers. You can generate app server code. Run it inside you know, JWE or .NET, whatever. Or, as we chose to do, uh, you can put it in a RESTful server. Now, I, I told you we'll talk about REST in just a second, but that's kind of a, a simplified, if, if you haven't run into REST before, just think of it as a simplified app server. The reason, the reason REST is important, and I think it's real important, and if you haven't uh, bumped into REST uh, yet, you will soon, uh, quite independently of tonight, is because REST is a really good way for mobile apps to talk to computers. You're used to JDBC, ODBC, if you're, you know, those technologies, or, or something like that. Those are all separate things. Don't call it calls, whatever you want to call it. But it's like, you're talking to stuff that's in your computer. If you're writing a mobile app, this is the thing you want the data issue on talk to is not in your computer. The server team call is not going to get you there, right? So, you, so REST is basically an HTTP protocol that can go across the wire and results come back. So it's a network aware interface to the APIs, which is a really good thing. As such, it's essentially, maybe not even essentially, it's a web service. Lots of hype around web services, and there should be, because they make your data available both to mobile apps and other computers. That's a really good thing. Uh, and you can make yourself a public API out of that. So there's an awful lot of value in going with these REST servers. So let's talk about REST. So what would, what would a REST hold? So what I'm going to ask you, can you make that thing go away? I'm going to show some REST here. So find the product. So here's what a REST call looks like. This is the HTTP part, and at the front, this, this, this whole big thing here, that's basically the location of your server, just a URL. And on the end, there's a thing called a RESTful endpoint. In this case, it's the customer and business object, which we haven't defined yet. Uh, but we'll talk about that in a moment. And so you use your normal HTTP sort of mechanisms, which exist in every language, and you issue this call as a GET. So basically HTTP says you can do GET, POST, PUT, and delete. So if you do a GET, well, what comes back is the boatload of the stuff down below, which is, if you've never seen it before, that's JSON, JSON. That's essentially the encoding format that um, JavaScript uses for data. So that's a data structure in, uh, say visual basic, in JavaScript. If this level of people are reading it, this says, here comes a rubber. You, got, you already guessed this is main value, main value, main value. And then there's other data that's in, in, under this. There would be not just the customer, but the orders. So it's not a relational API, because it's giving kind of multi-level results, right? So that's what, that's, what REST, that's what a REST database looks like. What's not shown here, is if you want to put a slash here and add parameters for filters and for things like sorts. So it's essentially a very simplified version of SQL as long as you can set up whatever this customer business object is. Let me stop. Is that, it seems, I think that's, you know, it's, it's no more tricky than that. Okay. We have not talked about where this customer business object comes from, but that's the way it works. We go back to it. We'll get out of PowerPoint as quickly as we can. Okay, so if you wanted to build a RESTful server, and there's lots of subroutine libraries in every language for building a RESTful server. They're not so simple. They're, they're just a whole bunch of, you know, mumbo-jumbo stuff. It takes, it takes some time. 
But what you, you know, a good first impulse would be, okay, I'll look at my schema, every table becomes an input. So if my schema has customers, orders, and items, and departments, and employees, those are restful endpoints. And the verbs are, as we said earlier, get most quickly. Whatever I as we said, JSON is the interchange. That's the JavaScript we saw on the bottom of the screen. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's the arguments for filtering and sorting. So that's what we just saw. Okay, that's just a repeat. Is it enough? No. If you, if you go to your favorite mobile programmer and you show what we just showed them, they'd go. And they'd say, well, you know, I really want a richer API that shows like a tree of things. I was looking at that. Customers with orders and business options. So, but this is a good start. If you had that, people would know you, you, know, you, you have the basics, the basic start for us. So that, and, and once you have that, now you, your mobile phones can start talking to your, uh, to your database. Other computers can talk to your database. You've got web services, so you can talk to, other computers can talk to your database. That's a pretty big deal to have that. Now, is JDBC or ODBC a great API? Your, your guess is as good as mine. Is it adequate? Absolutely not. Because underneath it, there should be business logic, right? If I store an order, there better be a customer for it. I can't buy, you know, five rolls voices because I can't afford it. So there's business logic that's got to happen when you try to do a sale. There's also business logic that's got to happen if I try to read my boss's salary. There's security implications. So an API that simply moves the bits around is a good start. But it's by no means enough. You definitely want to have the business logic, let's call it for integrity and security, enforceable. Okay? Well, so what we do is we must push these two ideas together. What if we could sort of have some interface, which I haven't described in a moment, I will describe in a moment, that allowed me to point at a database, point at a schema, and boom, I had a RESTful API to it, just by basically introducing it. Um, sorry, I'm putting on here. And just by connecting the, to my service, let me call it a service, by connecting my service to the database, I had a full starter kit RESTful API to all my base tables. With get most good and so forth. Number one. And number two, I had some interface that could add these derivation validation expressions in this reactive stuff. Then I'd have an API out of the box that I could very quickly add logic to with the level of abstraction of a spreadsheet as opposed to the level of abstraction of T-SQL or something pretty low level or job or whatever you want That would be a RESTful reactive database service. That would be pretty interesting. It would not be quite enough. You need some other stuff. What would really be cool is that I could take this as my out of the box, if you will, and then I could add to it, oh, and by the way, I'd like a multi-table app. You know, with master detail, screen transitions, lookups, tab sheets, blah, blah, blah. How about, how about you throw that in for free? The kind of the, the data maintenance apps we always write. I've alluded to this a couple of times, but I, I could also define rich resources, you know, customers and orders and items all along together, so I could have an API that talks about business object, not just flat tables. So some way of saying that. I could add logic not only reactively, but with JavaScript. So, you know, we, we could have kind of a Windows versus Mac thing about the .NET people versus the, the Java people versus the Ruby people. I don't really want to do that, probably you don't either. But if we did that, the one thing that we, I think almost everybody would agree with, it's a JavaScript's okay. Because everybody has to deal with JavaScript because it's in the browser. It's the one language that everybody has to sort of contend with. So we're using it now on the server for the, uh, the business logic. And now we'll add stuff in for security, I'll talk about that, and debugging and logging and the stuff that it's as a programmer. That would be maybe pretty interesting. This is all, what I've been talking about, that this I've been talking about, 
I mentioned the word schema probably half a dozen times already. So that's the basis of the model. That's the, that's the model on which the reactive logic happens. It's the model on, on the basis of which the rest of the server happens. So our, our particular take on this is based on the SQL database approach. I'm more than aware, and I'm sure you are too, that there's a lot of adherence of NoSQL. And this is probably oversimplified, but this is kind of the way the SQL to NoSQL people would sort of say that you know, this approach makes sense. Most you know, people that know all of this would probably say one makes sense in some cases and others make sense in other cases. It kind of depends on the problem, which I think is the right answer. But what people didn't think about talking about NoSQL is this notion of sharding. In other words, I can have my database engine spread over multiple computers, which in the days of the, of the web and so forth, you know, allows me to handle very, very high level. This is like the you know the Twitter, the Twitter database or something like that. And there's no schema. Now, by schema I'm talking about the DDL stuff, right? The stuff that I hate to write it, you probably hate to write it yourself. Every time you do it, there's a syntax error. You know, the syntax error says error 47 and a half. You know, whatever. And you look it up, and finally you Google it, and somebody tells you what it actually meant. It's not any kind of that. But you get some benefit out of it, right? You, you, you make sure you don't store I am a duck in the middle of the customer balance field, right? Which you can do with a NoSQL database. And in row one, it could be the balance, and row two, it could be the balance, or some, some print spelling of balance. So you wind up with, with data in your database that, you know, it can be quite a mess. So the schema enforces some sort of basic validity on your data that can be helpful, can be a straight jacket, but when you need it, it's extremely helpful. It also enables other tools to discover what your data is like, like a report writer. So if you write, a SQL database, there's any number of report writers and BI tools that are more than happy to take a whole bunch of work off your shoulders. Okay. That's all. So that's what I'm talking about here. SQL, I would talk about the integrity of the tooling, and then finally transactions. Transactions are near and dear to me, because most of the work I've done in my in sort of my work have been you know transaction-oriented applications and it's just not very good form to store the order and not update the customer balance and sort of not finish the transaction. I mean, most kind of interesting corporate applications pretty much require that stuff, otherwise you know, there's no integrity to your database. Why did I put this slide up? Because that's, that's, that's what we say on paper. In reality, I think, and in many cases, the reason a lot of folks are starting to use NoSQL quite a lot is they hate writing a schema. And if you hate writing a schema, NoSQL says, hello, just take your JavaScript stuff and, and say save, and I'll save it for you, and then you can get it back, and we won't ask you about any schema, and if you save something else, we'll save that too. So you, you've got to sort of get your, your ability to save and restore data without any work to finding a schema. Okay, that's good. Uh, and if you're a mobile pro programmer, even better, it's in the form of REST. That's the, that's the API you want. What I'm going to show you now is basically, and that's good, I mean, I'm, I'm as lazy as the next person, <laughs> probably lazier. This notion of getting um, REST for free is, is, which historically has been the value of NoSQL to a lot of people in a practical sense. I'm just going to basically make that go away <laughs> because I'm going to generate a REST API right now. Okay, I think we're done with slide. I think there's one more slide. Okay, stop here. Oh, let's go. Does this, does this, you probably can't read this, but I don't think you need to. Does this form look familiar to you? Have you built this like a hundred times in your life? Right? I mean, okay. here, here you're picking a table. Here's a little search area where you can search on, you know, people who live in New York and you know have balances greater than thousand dollars. Here's the result list. It's it's paginated. Here's the rows. Here's the, the selected row. Here's an image. The rows have relationships to other data. In this case, an employee has orders. Here's a list of orders. 
there's a button on orders to go down and look at the detail of the orders to see how about three hammers and two shovels and one gold voice. Interesting business. There's lookups uh, to say, go get me a, whatever this is, or item. Change all the names. Have you built that application hundreds of times in your life? I mean, just. Now, and I'm going to make the statement that, you know, this is a blue collar, blue collar application, right? There's nothing special about it. You just write it by the bubble button. Then there's applications that you, it's called the bold plated applications. Okay? Where you're going to do, you're going to write Facebook or something like that, and you're willing to spend any amount of money to just thrill the end user. Okay? So those apps, clearly you're going to write by hand. What if this app was free? I mean, literally, you didn't have to write it. Okay? That's what this is. So when I say generate a data maintenance app from a schema, this is, this is in fact the data maintenance app built out of Norfolk, okay? where the person building it did not write any HTML, they didn't write any JavaScript. It is HTML and JavaScript underneath, which is nice because they're running a mobile app. But you can, these apps are now sort of computable. Okay? So then you take that sort of dreary app that you, you know, I mean, goodness, like, how, many, how many times are you going to write it? And they're just, they're just done with it. So let me show you how to do it. This is where it gets difficult, so okay. No, sorry. I want you to do it. Because otherwise I'm going to do a demo with my Mac turn. Even I know that's a pretty, pretty unfriendly way to do it. Okay. So this is our product. And this is, this is, I'm going to now show you a demo of Reactive and uh, REST database and, and uh, the UOS. So click home. So this is a little overview of the process. You have a database somewhere, on premise in the file. You connect, and what this is trying to sort of suggest is that by connecting, you're going to get this browser that we just looked at, you're going to get a RESTful API, and you're going to get a JavaScript object model that you can then use for this reactive logic and secure. And that's, that's the idea. Let's do it. So, so what, we're, what we're, I don't think you see. I didn't even see what you put, so. Just, just do it some more slowly. So go down. He just put the connect button. He put the connect button. Okay. okay, do it again. No, no, you were right. There's a hundred more people that see So I say, I want to build a new system. I work, so the, the assumption is, I've already got a database. So you build the database with your usual techniques, you know. MySQL workbench, Toad, you know, whatever you build. You got a database, maybe it's just test data, but you build it. And now you stick that one. So this is basically going to say, okay, you're going to have to tell us where your database is. First, tell us what type it is, so we can, you folks probably know that Oracle calls it, the, you know, the schema, MySQL calls it database, you know, blah, blah, blah. So they all have different names and things. So we ask you which database you're kind of predicting to so we can give you the right lingo to, to basically uh, build a connection. Well, when you're first starting out, we say, look, let's just make this simple. Let's do an example everybody understands. We've got a central version of Northwind from our, from our company. And we'll just click it out. So in other words, basically, one way or the other, you've got to give us the, this, you would recognize this as the JDBC connection. What the system is doing is going and reading the schema and saying, what have we got here? Just finding your object model and all that. And uh, Juan always likes to show that it's found. It just doesn't. It's not a, it's not a trustful person. So this is just showing, that, yes, I found your schema. Here's the tables and all those relationships that you already knew were there. And now you can see the system so. Now, we, I want you to, this looks like a cookie demo. This is not a cookie demo. This is, this is standard Northman. There's no code behind the scenes that you know, we've already built and just now revealing it. This is what it would be like if you tried to your database. So, Ron, you know, just go to the rest lab and you know, put it away. The big customers. So you 
Yeah. Uh, what exactly is the demo here? Sorry, I follow. This is our product, but I'm trying to demo a technology and a particular product that, that creates it. So the product, the technology I'm trying to demonstrate is reactive database that, that is uh, restful. Uh -huh. And we provide one so to make it more sensible. I'm actually showing what it will look at least a one incarnation. So what, what is this going to do? Is this, what are we trying to do? It just, built, it just built the RESTful API to the North Point database. Okay. Did that, that answer your question? That answers. So, and Mario, you can make the whole screen go over. So, there's lots of kinds of RESTful APIs. There's shortcuts and there's what you need when you really get going. So if you look at, right up at the top here, checksum, why would you use a checksum? For optimistic logging. There, is, there, is that a term really? Should I define optimistic logging as optimistic logging? Okay. No? How many would like a quick definition of optimistic logging? Optimistic logging says, when I retrieve data, uh, if I lock it, then that's, a, that's the dose of it. Because if I lock it, nobody else can read it. So the technique that almost everybody uses now is you retrieve the data unlocked and let the person update it. And then when you put it back, you make sure that it didn't change since they retrieved it. Then you get the optimistic view that nobody else will probably update that row from the time it was retrieved until the time you press save. To do that, and, and then if you've ever programmed that, that's very boring and it takes a long time. So a server that knows what it's doing should provide that out of the box and that's what that is. Well, I think you can figure it out at the bottom.
People, can people guess where this comes from, these tab sheets? Guesses? I have t-shirts. <laughs> and I don't think... Tables with bar and keys. Tables with... <laughs> I already had one, fooled you. <laughs> but I have very bad aim. <laughs> <laughs> And it's updatable, so you can update these things. You get the idea, and it's kind of the app you build. You know, scroll around, sort by the great editors, do searches, and selects. You know, you know I, I'm not sure I want to belabor this. Does anybody have any? Does this look like what you expect? So it's this, if you're, if you're, all the interfaces are made by the server or the It's an HTML, it's an HTML app. So it's HTML5 JavaScript app. So when, when you click this big nasty URL up at the top, we, we put the JavaScript for it. And, and most of the JavaScript is generic. It's just, it's sort of responsive to your table name, your table, your, your, your schema. So we, take the code and that's a very good question. So he's asking, and I realize most people probably can't hear. And I'm going to guess what you're after, because it's what I would be after. It's like, well, this is, this is, you know, even if I want to build a gold-plated app, I'd like this to be one rectangle. Can, can I use this in another app? We haven't built it yet, but very soon, uh, you'll be able to take this app and make an iframe app. And then you're going to close it in a larger, larger page. And the security is built into the rest of the interface that's built That's right. Um, that's a discussion. Can I postpone that just for a second? But that's a, for sure, if they weren't there, this would not be interesting. Gotcha. So when you're talking about a reactive uh, program, if I were to uh, drop a column or change a column's data type, yeah. the product would automatically compensate for those changes and write the script? It would. It would. Okay. So, so and I don't know how many IT managers I've talked to have been sort of stating your question. And I asked my team to add one column to the database. It, it said, it's going to take me 12 months. <laughs> you know, and we've all said that because we know the testing and all that. that. Basically, this will react to the schema because it's, it's derived from the schema. Any changes you make to the schema will change the way it looks. How would it know that the schema changes? There's a button to say the schema's changed. Take a look. No, it's always looking at the schema. It doesn't. But the schema could be hosted elsewhere. It's looking at your. It's looking at your database, so it's looking at your schema. It's pulling it. It's not pulling it. There's a button to say refresh the refresh the cache of the schema. But the but, but that's actually not one of. Please. So this uh, works best on the computer. It'll work. On it. It'll show the data for sure. Well, let me get back to this. Did I answer your question? Now, what I mean with reactive is different than what you meant. So you're, you're, what you meant made sense, reactive schema changes. I was really meaning react with respect to data changes. Changes in the data. Well, let's switch over to logic demo. So this is Northbound. We just imported it or, you know, connected to it. Obviously, it has no logic in it because we haven't defined it. So now I'm going to switch to a, a different database and show you some reactive logic and how it works, how it, how it responds to changes in data. So one is pick, you know, the database up here. Let's pick that. So just click this. So, and, and it can be a weakness. I mean, the, so far it's been kind of a generic data process again. You actually need to read this. Um, it's uh, Apple, what's called command plus. Oh, I thought it was Apple. <laughs> <laughs> Can you read it yet? Very good. Okay, so what I'd like to do is sort of play the following game with you. Who would like to be my business? Would you be my business user? Okay. You don't look like your heart's in it. <laughs> yeah. You don't look like you want to teach me. <laughs> okay, so let's say you're my business user and what you want to 
He told me he wanted an application to track orders or something. We we're using orders since everybody understands it. And I say, okay, here's your, here's your app. How do you like it? And he'd say, it's pretty good, but maybe if you're testing it, we realize that I can order 55 of those voices that I can't afford. You say, well, we need to check credit. So we log a business requirement, we need to check credit. So what do I do? I basically, well, what does check credit mean? And you, you might say something like, that means the balance has got to be less than the credit. Okay, so I'd write it down. I'd write it down something like this. Just to make a note. And then I just make you define your terms. I never heard of balance before. What is the balance? You tell, us, you tell me it's the sum of the unpaid order terms. The balance test. spreadsheet formula to you? I mean, squinting your eyes. I mean, it's not Excel, it's not the UI. But conceptually, this column, this database column, is defined that way. Notice it's multi-table. That is, it's involving both customers and orders, right? Which is, we'll come back to that, but that's that's not trivial. Because there's going to be, there will be secret <laughs> problems, right? What is the, what is the amount total? That's the sum of the line item amounts. What's a line item amount? So, so we've all done analysis. It really boils down to a stepwise definition of terms, right? What's that? Well, what's that? Well, what's that? Well, what's that? And you're sort of logging all this stuff as knowledge to go back and do the program. I mean, does that, does that sort of ring true to you? And if we continue on, um, the, um, the amount was the price times the quantity. Where, that, where the price came from the market. Now, I would contend that's a very good spec. Because I, I now know not how to do adding an order, but I know a lot about your data. And I know how to go build what it means to add an order, but also to delete an order, the balance should go down. What if I pay off an order? The balance should go down. So what you're doing is you're, you're reacting in your mind, you're playing the reactive programming game. When this changes, here's what I should do. And you're doing it because you understand that. Now, let me ask a question. If I gave you this as a spec, and I asked you to write triggers, how, how many lines of triggers do you think it would take to do not just place order, but all the use cases that touch this data? Adding order, deleting an order, Paying an order, moving an order from customer one to customer two, when balance goes up, changing the line item, changing the quantity, changing the part number, deleting the line item, all that stuff. Everything that this, do you think it's, you know, a dozen, a couple hundred, millions? 500. Sorry? 500. 500. That's a very, who said that? <laughs> You should be giving the presentation. Can we pass this? I think I'm going to knock over too many beers. So just pass the t-shirt on that. We did two things in our company. We wrote it once in Java, and the answer was pretty close to 500. The answer in, in triggers was about 220. Why does this spec go up to 40 times its size? It's because of dependency management. It's not the sequels that kill you. It's when to issue the sequels. Did this change, then do that. If this changes, and what if they changed in concert? What if this changed and that changed? And blah, blah, blah. You know, and is that hard programming? No. Is it error prone? You bet. Is it something you've done a million times? At least. Mm -hmm. That's what reactive programming solves. Reactive programming, basically our specification, our agreement what the system do is execute. This actually runs, and runs across all the use cases. So if I could speak like an object-oriented person, which I think I could do, you know, back before there was object-oriented, all the logic was in the calling application. We still do that today, but we put the logic in the controllers of our UI. That's really easy. <laughs> that means you can't use that logic at any other button. You, know, you can't use it for a service. 
That's a horribly bad thing to do, but very common. Object-oriented people would prefer that that logic be moved into the objects in your server. So now you've gone from calling code to what's called insert update delete objects or events in your data. But you're still doing very similar things between the insert and the delete and the empty, right? They're updating the balance, right? What we're doing here, what Reactor does, is it goes one step further in of encapsulization where you've gone from the object and its methods into the attribute definitions. And that means that the logic that you would have written in the methods now is encapsulated into the attributes. That's a gigantic idea. That's why five lines of this stuff replace two to five hundred lines of handwritten code. That's a very big thing. And is, in a certain sort of way, error-free. Now, I don't mean error-free. Obviously, I can make a mistake in Excel by giving you the wrong formula. But if I give it the formula, it's going to be consistently applied to every use of the data. That same statement becomes true here. So the number of errors goes down enormously. I mean, you can still state the wrong thing, but at least it'll be consistent. <laughs> so now you put the two up. Um, where do the definitions come from? Data can be manipulated any way you want it, and a definition based on data is only going to be as good as the data that you see. This is programming. So I, I will, so why don't you show some, why don't you show some of this? But where did the formulas come from in programming? You can't just take, unless you're taking them from stored procedures. No, no, we're done. Let me show you. Let me show you. That's the right question. So here's the definition of the sum rule. If the sum rule didn't exist, I would have said create new rule. And we know what a sum means. A sum in the, in the database term means a sum over, as you said, you know, for accumulation chain. So if I'm building a sum rule for a customer, then I just pick a column of customer. I pick something that's related through here, you know, um, foreign key relationships, and I pick some attribute or whatever I chose here, and here I give a qualification expression. So I just enter it into the browser. So I, I those didn't come from the schema, those came from me. As a, as a basis, as a basis of me talking to you. So I talked to you, I ran back to my office and typed that in, I was good to go. So that's one place to go. Why don't you show the amount? The amount rule? I bought out of the amount. I think we lost the connection. While he's getting that back, basically, you can, in addition to entering this kind of forms oriented logic, you can also enter JavaScript. So I can say, if this is that, and then use this you know, price times quantity, otherwise, price times quantity times quantity. Can you do that? recognize JavaScript. So what we're doing with this JavaScript is we're actually parsing it down and we're figuring out what it depends on. Because that's what Reactive is about, right? We figure out what you refer to, what you depend on. So we're parsing down your JavaScript. So if you change the JavaScript, you'll change a lot of how the system operates in, in the way you, you expect it to work. The point about JavaScript is
So this is what you're probably used to. Uh, it says, before the reactive engine starts working, let me just write some JavaScript. Kind of like trigger, but it's a JavaScript trigger that runs in the rest of the server, not in the database. And the object model for this is, guess what, your schema. So right off the bat, you've got your schema, and that's what you refer to as the road. So this is an event for purchase order. So it knows, okay, we have a purchase order here, and I know what the attributes of the purchase order are, because the schema tells me so. So I get to say, you know, purchase order dot not total, I can say old row, so I can see, you know, who got a 10% raise or more than a company that has state transition. And um, can we separate all this from the SMB uh, post code to get like different validation? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what do you want to do? Scroll over there. This is, this is a PC user trying to use a Mac. And the Mac, of course, if you had a Mac, about three or four years ago, they decided that up was down and down was up. Which was amusing. Uh, and now when people trade computers, it's sort of, they can figure that out. You have to figure it out. Oh, okay, okay, no, no, no. And then get on and down the lowest. There you go. Keep going. code is doing is an audit. Right? It's saying if, if the amount of the order changes right out of the road to the purchase order audit team. So if you read it, you know, off to the right here, it says if the row total is not equal to old row total, then create, this says create a new object to type purchase order audit, fill it up and save it. Now, that's, that's a very good illustration of what you can do with JavaScript. But if you do a lot of audit, that can get kind of tiresome. So, what, what, if you scroll down just a year one. So, what this comment about stuff says if you recognize your own patterns, you can upload JavaScript libraries to essentially extend the rule engine. And what this particular one does, it says so instead of writing this code out by hand, I could just invent a new rule called the audit rule, it's called. And this would say you know, insert a child row name this, um, and that's all you have to do. Why, why would we not put the audit trigger in the like, like SQL database itself? You could. Oh. I mean, basically, you know, you either believe in three-tier computing or you believe in two-tier computing. If you believe in triggers, you can do all the stuff in triggers, but you're going to write a lot. We're saying that's a, not an unreasonable choice. Now, I'm not here to argue about that. What I am here to argue is that even if you did that, you'd want to risk the API. So if you go to RESTful API, you can have a better programming model using JavaScript with this declarative stuff than you can do in TC. I mean, I used to work inside of this. I know T C will inside out. It's a frightfully bad language. I mean, it's, it's just horrible. Right? But it's, you know, I would, all, I would rather use almost anything. But where do custom classes and methods come to the library? There's, there's a place you can upload your own libraries. That's what I'm trying to oh. So that, that's what this is. I'm saying, I updated, I uploaded my own JavaScript library and implemented the own, my own, the patterns that I myself noticed that these idiots from Espresso didn't bake into the system. Is the primary use case of Espresso for people who don't want to have their own? Like no, no, no. We, we assume that many people, not necessarily all, but many, many will want to have their own libraries. And that's a core piece of it. Our, our kind of mantra is we automate far more than you think, but we're not so nuts as to think we automate everything. So there has to be this extensibility. It's core to that. And it's not easy. An extensible rule engine is hard. So where in the interface do I see all my different... Well, if you go into a 
project. So we we preload a bunch of libraries like you know the data is a library and yada yada and you can upload your own. Yeah. So you just, you would just upload your own, you know, what they call minify file. JavaScript or top. Sorry about that. Uh, I may have missed this, I came in late. Do you have a caching layer? Yes. Yes, and I think that's a very good question. You better give it eight. Huh. I know my job. Yeah. It made it like a t shirt. So thank, thanks for the question. There's one here that way. He's asked a question about caching, and, he's, and it's good. Let's go to the rest of the We do our order items thing here. We get the order items. Let me just switch kind of Not this one. So what we've done, sorry about that. So what we've done is we've, we've done our JSON for it to get. We took the first line item and we're now going to change its quantity from one to two or something like that. This is simulating what a, a mobile app would do. I read, read the data down, I change it, and then I put it back. Let's see what the system does with that. So it takes that to so now I'm going to make this a put, which is an update. So if you use Excel, you know, you, you put something in and like stuff happens, you're like, why did you do all the stuff with did? It's not even easy to find out. So what we do here, so what the, you're there. So what this is, is a complete record of what the system did in terms of logic and SQL processing that request. And what you're going to see here is the system not only does caching, it turns what everybody here, if they're paying close attention, 
the customer's balances. You probably thought that was select sum of blah, 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 blah. It wasn't. The systems actually turned the SQL inside out and said, oh, I know what I can do here. Because imagine if you had a customer with thousands of orders, each order had thousands of items, and you did the query to roll that up. That's, that's the query from now. So what the system has done is it's going to turn it into one row updates. So that means these sort of roll-ups and sums and counts are now virtually free. That's a gigantic statement, right? Because there's many systems that have full nightly processing runs to do roll-ups and stuff. This says you can have them happen in real time because they're virtually free. And not only you don't have to have the nightly run, people have up-to-date up -to -date data during the entire day. So, so your application becomes simpler, you don't have to write the batch stuff, and people get a better result. So caching a lot more is the answer, and that will teach you to ask. <laughs> so well, let's, let's build the, the, the folks of resource. Now this, the logic we just saw was sitting, sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, sorry if I missed it, but when you did the put, data put, does it send all data? Just no, just one mode. Just, just to change mode. So when your client would, you know, it's up to you how you cover your client, but what we would expect in support is you treat like a bunch of stuff and then I change some things. If your client keeps track of what rows got changed, just one of in one case and send it back to the process. And, and, and in fact, send it back. So what's going to happen next? If you're doing a client app and I pay the order, the balance change, right? Those rules may change tomorrow, so you would have to refresh what the user sees. What the system does, so we know what you're going to need to do. So we send back all the changes to you, so you can update your display without having to make another trip to the server. That, that just cuts your, your network traffic in half. Or other How does your resourcing model work? Like, like is that a thing that's not your server? And all the caching is provided by you guys? We, 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 yeah, so the, there's, there's two answers to that. Both are correct. Uh, so it could have been two t-shirts, I guess. <laughs> uh, yeah, an option. One, one is to have the, the server posted on uh, Amazon. Or if, if it's medical data, that's just not going to happen. You can also provide a VMware appliance and you can run it inside the cloud. So too, the database itself can be either on the cloud or on the cloud. We were building a resource. So, backing up, so what, what happened, right? We, we connected to our database, bang, we got a default REST API, we put a flat. Then we added the logic, kind of like a spreadsheet, using our browser. And that API is enforcing that logic, either from that pre-built UI that we saw, with the gal's picture on it or just from straight API calls, like from computer to computer. So now let's ask the question, well, wait a minute, I'm building a mobile app, I don't want a flat API, I want to see customers and orders and help keep up all together, right? How would I build that? So go ahead, Mark, just, just build it once. So, so these things are called RESTful endpoints. We call them resources, that's it. This is essentially like building a view, not, not very much different, except views are flat. Right? Every row in the view has the same format, the same font. Right? That's not what your mobile programmers want. They want just the view. They want things with the nest in the tree, right? So that's what Ron is building. And the way he does it is he, he picks a table, and then he picks a related table. Like purchase order. Purchase order. And what this did is it filled in the join. He can project away the attributes he doesn't want. He can alias them. So now you have an API that's like what you wanted as opposed to what the database dictated. Now, we're all programmers. You know, I, I've worked on JTWE for 15 years. What happens next? In a typical environment, you, you compile it, then you deploy it, you go out for lunch. You know, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a long, you know, boom. But this, this is a whole different world. This is the world of the cloud, the world of the service. You're not supposed to work that way. The service is supposed to help. Right? That's the idea. So, between this 
from the west side. If I'm a sales rep, 
I'm going to inject this security filter into every query that a sales rep does against my data. So in this particular example, the sales rep was only going to see their own orders or maybe their own reaches or something like that. This example is a little bit more complicated than that. I'm happy to I think just the general idea. So what this is giving you is a very big deal. It's giving you low level security. And it's giving it to you no matter what resource is running. Because it's it's encapsulated into the table, so it's projected over all the views. Last thing is it's also controlling what columns you see. So you and I issue the same request, but you're going to see different data than I do because we have different ones. So you're going to have to find different views for everybody. You find a view that makes is logical, and then we'll take the data out of the system. So we've covered quite a lot of stuff. It's late on a Thursday. Uh, you've asked a lot of very good questions. I really enjoyed it. Uh, are there any final questions, or should we bring up the, the slinger of teachers? Wait, before, uh, Thank you. before we go on to the final Q and A, um, I'd like to give a great big round of applause to co-founder and CTO. Basically what I showed you 
You see, if you just sort of point at your database, you get that app with master detail navigation with zero work. I mean zero work. Right? So if, if you're messing with your data, like check test data, prepare test data, or, you know, prepare, prepare production data, even without trying to sort of contend with all the technology I showed you, just that might be worth 15 minutes of thinking to, to sort of sign up. So that's something you can, I would like to think it's something you can use tomorrow. It makes it worthwhile to just not hold late to that. Okay, Val will be here for one-on-one -on -one questions, so anyone who did not get a chance to ask a question, by all means, come up and talk to him. Thank you very much, Val Hubbard. Woo!